Father, we thank you for what you're doing in us, in this body. Lord, we thank you for the worship and the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you that you helped us this morning, Lord, that you helped the singers and the musicians, that you helped the technical end of things, Father God, that, Lord, that you got us up this morning, gave us food and and clothes and, and air to breathe. You brought us in here, Lord, with bodies that work and arms that we can raise and feet that we can dance with. God, of your own have we given back to you, and everything that we have comes from you. Be glorified in this place. Lord, be glorified. Get all that you're going after in us. We want to be completely owned by you. Holy Spirit, possess us as your own. We don't want to be possessed by the materialism, the things of the world or demons, but we do want to be possessed every nook and cranny by you, Holy Spirit. Come, anoint the word, the word in season. Anoint the word, Lord God. Draw us together into unity with your Holy Spirit and with one another, that we would seek you with with a perfect heart, in one spirit, in Jesus' precious and mighty name. Hallelujah. A word in season. What's this? I don't have a bulletin. What's the scripture on the front there? Thank you. Let's just go there really quickly just to see what his text was, shall we? Because <laughs> I'm going to take you in a slightly different direction, but. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, Proverbs 15, 23. And a word spoken in due season, how good it is. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth. And a word spoken in due season, how good it is. I'm sure there's been situations and circumstances in your life in which the answer that came to you when you were asked a question And we can get asked questions, not just by people, but by circumstances. We can get asked a question when something tragic happens in our life, when we lose a loved one, when we lose a job, when a business deal goes sideways, when something we were expecting to happen doesn't happen, often the question is why. What does this scripture say? A man has joy by the answer of his mouth. What will be the answer of our mouth to all that has happened? As Brian spoke this week, past couple of weeks have been intense. I don't think it's just me. Anybody else had an intense past couple of weeks? Family issues, struggles, warfare, fights, near misses, accidents, injury, sickness. And a word spoken in due season, how good it is. I'll submit to you that that the best answer to the question of why is another question. And the answer is, forget why, what's next? Hallelujah. When something happens in your life and you don't understand what is going on, we can get stuck at why. And the Lord says, some of that is too deep for you to understand now, but why don't you ask me what's next? I won't always tell you why, but if you ask me what's next, I'll show you. A voice like a trumpet spoke to John, the apostle, in the book of Revelation. He said, I saw a door standing and open in heaven, and I heard a voice speaking to me, saying, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. This is passing away. Whatever this is, you're in comfort, it's passing away. You're in trials, they're passing away. I love the King James because it would say many times in the Old Testament, and it came to pass in those days. (laughs) And I'm happy because... Some things that come, I'm really glad that they don't come to stay. I'm glad that they come to pass. But there is something that's coming to stay. 
There's a kingdom that cannot be shaken. There's a continuing city. And God is inviting us through a word in season this morning to enter into it even now. Even now. He says in his word, Behold, I do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Shall you not perceive it? Listen, God switched this season on us, people, four weeks ago. If you were here, the Lord began to move in this place in an amazing way. And we felt it. But how many are still carrying what the Lord did? Some of you are. Some of you came and there was an amazing service and, and the Lord spoke a word. He had given me a word on building with living stones. And the funny thing was, I couldn't put the word together on Saturday night. And he said, that's right, because I'm the builder. I couldn't assemble the word. I couldn't figure out where to start, where to go next. I just had all these pieces. And he said, you come with your pieces on Sunday morning. And the worship was, again, amazing as it was this morning. And then the Lord, as I stood up, began to assemble and put things together. And he assembled the word just like he wants to assemble us for a holy habitation for his spirit. And when we were done the service, there was half or two-thirds of the body was forward on their faces. And the Lord was dealing with an independent spirit. And the week after, he spoke to us about, about a spirit of entitlement. I have a right to me. I have a right to my time. I have a right to my money. I'm supposed to tithe 10%. That's Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus wants it all. Come and follow me. What did he say to the rich young ruler? If you're on your knees in your prayer closet praying and praying that he won't say that to you, your money's already got a hold of you. We need to put everything we have and everything we are continually on the altar. He may not come and require you to give it today, but it better be on the altar today. Because if it's not on the altar, it's an idol in your heart, whether it's your job, your finances, your, your spouse, your children, whatever it would be. Jesus was plain. He said, if any man loves father or mother, son or daughter, land, properties, more than me, he's not worthy of me. He wants all of us. He wants all of us. And he's speaking to us. And he's come and he said, I want to build you as living stones. And there's some things, some spirits that hinder you becoming a living stone. That's right, becoming. It would be nice to just think, I already am a living stone. I think within our stones that there can be a faint fire flickering, a little pulsation of life and a lot of hardness around it. And God wants to come by his spirit, and he wants to breathe into us the word of life, the breath of life, and that pulsation will increase, and it will permeate the hardness of our hearts and the culture that we live in until one morning we wake up and we realize, I don't want anything more than you. Amen. And that feeling will stay with us throughout the day. When we go to Tim's and we grab a coffee, we'll drink it and think, that's nice, but it's not as good as you. You say, I don't know, that sounds super spiritual or something. We're supposed to be supernatural. We're not supposed to be living for here. We're supposed to be instant in and out of season, having a word to sustain the weary. He wants to awaken us morning by morning, Isaiah chapter 50, to listen like one being taught. To listen to what he's saying to his church. The word in season is a word that I believe God is speaking to us. And it's the word abide. God wants us to abide. Jesus wants us to abide. He wants us to abide in him. He wants us to live in him. He wants us to be constantly conscious of his presence. 
constantly in communion with him, even in the midst of, of, of work and, and details and life, that we are aware of his presence. You can't always be on your knees, hands clasped, on your face, praying in tongues. But as you go about your life, you can be constantly in an attitude of prayer. Many of you will know of Brother Lawrence, who wrote a book. He was back in the 1700s. He was a monk, and, and he, it was a book called Practicing the Presence of God. And people would come from miles around, poor and rich alike, to watch him wash dishes. Because the way in which he even went about menial chores carried such a peace, carried such a love, such a rightness and alignment with God. Listen, if we're going to see Canada changed it's gonna it's gonna cost it's gonna cost us something it's gonna cost us more than what we have given up until this point insanity is doing the same thing expecting different results we're we're waiting for something to happen from outside maybe if we pray finally god will drop down or he'll, he'll do something and there'll be like this thing that'll happen we're not quite sure what it'll look like but something will happen and then we can all be like oh finally revival has come like like colin said if the prophetic word has been that the lord is going to use canada and south africa to finance world time revival then at some point, the people in Canada and South Africa have to open up their hands. The prophetic words that come are never to change your circumstances. They're to change you, and then you will change your circumstances. You will change your circumstances because the kingdom of God is within you. We're always praying, oh Lord, rend the heavens, come down. He's like, I did. I sent myself. Jesus came down, walked the earth, lived here for 33 years, ministered, died a death, was buried and rose again, gave a command, said, wait, I'm going, but wait, because the comforter is coming. He went 10 days later, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of us. The same spirit that raises Jesus from the dead dwells in our mortal body. We keep praying for God, won't you do something? Can you do something else? He says, no, I've done everything. It's your turn. It's your turn. It's your turn. So how is this going to happen? How are we, we going to become living stones? We're going to abide. We're going to abide in him. The danger for us during my sabbatical in the summer, my wife and I traveled and went to some different churches. And I identify with Andy. It's good to see you, young wit, Kaylee. I identify with the fervor that is in this place, the freedom that we have in worship, where we're free to lift our hands and, and, and dance and sing and young and old together. But I'm concerned sometimes that his charismatics we can sit there and hear a word and go, whoa, whoa, that's God. Where are we going for lunch? That was a good word, wasn't it? Oh, could I have a little more pepper with that? I need something spicy. And we go week to week just getting another word. Revenue Canada is coming this coming week. To audit us. Yay. <laughs> what did the Lord say to Paul? Hey, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. It's me. I want things in alignment. And I'll use circumstances and situation and people, places, and things to bring you into alignment. And sometimes we go, oh, I didn't, this feels uncomfortable. Cop gave me a ticket. <laughs> and the Lord is saying, hey, it's me. It's me. The Lord is seeking to bring us into alignment. And I'm praying and saying, Lord, help us humble ourselves. Give us the ability to humble ourselves. You know, we've, 
done what we know to do and we're getting as prepared as we can be, but it's quite possible that they're tax people. They're Revenue Canada. they pretty particular. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Where do we need adjusting? The wise man receives reproof. The mocker despises correction. Lord, if we need correction, we receive it. We receive it. So the Lord speaks as he has spoken through the worship. Last week, guys, the presence in here was so strong. When Brian stepped out in an utterance in tongues with an interpretation, and then Kathy came forward, she just had a word. And Brian said, no, you give it. And she went to give it, and the anointing came all over her, and she began to sing it. The presence of God is so strong here. But I believe it's just a foretaste of what he wants to do. What he wants to do. He wants to give you and I revival more than we want it. He wants to love us more than we want to love him. He wants us to enter into relationship with him more than we want to enter in relationship with him. And he's calling us, and the word that he keeps speaking is secret place. Come into the secret place. Abide with me. Abide with me. Live in my presence. And so we won't do a show of hands. But I want you to ask yourself before God this morning, did you do anything different this week from last week? Don't raise your hands. Just honestly, the Lord says he desires truth in the inward parts. Listen, you lie to other people, that's one thing. Please don't lie to yourself. Just between you and the Lord, say, did I go about my business just the same this week as I did last week? Because if that's the case, what are we doing? And I believe many of you did push in. But you know what? It's going to take a corporate anointing. It's going to take a corporate contending for us to see the Lord pour out what he wants to do. And if the Lord is coming to his people and he's saying, listen, I have a word for you. I want to build you as living stones, but there's some things that get in the way. There's an independent spirit. Repent. Deal with it. And he dealt with the independent spirit. And some people, it'll try and come back. Don't let it. You can cast out a spirit. You can't cast out a habit. You have to break the habit. The habit of, I'm just going to do me, and I'm going to give a certain amount of time to God's kingdom. Well, no, no, no. The church. I'm in his kingdom. See, in the book of Acts, they met together daily, house to house, breaking their bread and eating their meat with gladness and in the temple courts. We're not quite ready for that. I believe the Lord is going to take us there. They came and they heard Peter speak at Pentecost, the message. Many of them did not go back to the to the places that they had come from, they stayed in Jerusalem and became the church. Because Scripture says, and there was in Jerusalem in those days God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Those were the ones that came together to hear the message preached, and many of them didn't go back. They stayed and heard. Obviously, some did. But there was a need for discipleship. There was a need to learn about what we've, we've been thinking one way, and all of a sudden Jesus comes, and he's out of our box. And the apostles who'd been with Jesus for three, three, three and a half years needed to disciple them. And they stayed. And their whole focus, see, the kingdom of God was the focus of, our act, of their activity. For us, church is just another activity. Well, I go to the gym, and I do this, and I do this, and I have this, and I have this hobby, and I have this group, and I have this. this, this. Oh, and I also go to church on Sunday. And I might go to early morning prayer once in a while. And I might, uh, maybe I do a Wednesday night thing or something. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I, think, I think you should be fine with those leftovers, God. God says, I want all of you. I want all of you. So what does that look like? Because you still have lives. I still have a life. There's still needs. Abide. Abide in me. Abide in me. Live in me. Set aside time for me. You know, we, we find time for what's important to us, right? I mean, even when there's lots of things asking for our attention, trying to remember who it was, a wise man said that an extremely busy man is a lazy man because he will not prioritize his time for what is important. For all of those workaholics among us, of which I have been very guilty. 
And I have busied myself with ministry, ministry, meeting this need. Why? Because it makes me feel good. Oh, look how, look how needed I am. All these people need me. And there are needs. There are needs. But the thing I need more than anything else is to spend time in his presence, at his feet. Martha was like, I'm making a delicious meal for you, Jesus. She's running around doing all sorts of things. But Jesus was speaking. Listen, Jesus was speaking. At the time that she was busy, he was speaking. There was revelation coming forward from his lips. And she was busy doing something that was going to make her feel good because then he was going to eat a meal and he was going to go, thank you, Martha, that was delicious. And she was going, oh, I fed the master. And he said, actually, the most important thing right now is that I feed you with the word, the bread of life that comes. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Words were proceeding from the mouth of God. And Mary discerned it, sat at his feet, and listened. And when Martha got upset, Jesus said, Mary has chosen the one thing that is needful, that is needed, and it will not be taken away from her. So the Lord speaks in Scripture, and he says, Seek me while I may yet be found. People, God is drawing near to us, I believe, many in the world, many bodies. But God is drawing near to us in this season, and there is a grace, a tangible grace that I can feel to enter into the secret place like never before. God is near. He is near you if you will draw near to him. He's ready to speak to you. He's ready to deliver you. He's ready to release revelation to you about your life, about your marriage, your children, your job, how to minister to the people around you. He's ready to do that. But if we hear a word and God says, I want you to enter into the secret place. And we go, that's nice. Where are we going for lunch? And I'm going to do next week like I did last week. Then we run the risk of missing out on the greatest blessing. It's going to require that we abide. Turn in your, in your Bibles to John chapter 15. Gospel of John chapter 15. Verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Oh, do we really believe that? Do I really believe that all the things that I'm doing that I have made more important than him are actually nothing of eternal value from his perspective. I remember uh, Cliff and Patricia, and back in 2011 when the Lord came and, and, and visited us in a, in a sovereign and profound way in this church and lovingly gave us a rebuke and told us to seek him. And as we began to seek him, we were having prayer and fasting three, three times a day, and, and it was a Monday evening in July of 2011. And Cliff was downstairs, and, and he, said, uh, he said, hey, uh, just as we were in prayer, he said, I, I, I had a crazy vision. And I thought, yeah, Cliff, you always have crazy visions, buddy. <laughs> that was sort of in my mind. I was just, and he said, yeah, I, I saw myself 300 years in the future. And I thought, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> he said, and it was during the millennium. The millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the thousand-year reign, which happens 
after the rapture and after Armageddon and all of that, when Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, I thought, 300 years? Okay, that doesn't sound too crazy. He says, I saw myself. He says, but I didn't see myself through my eyes. I saw myself through the eyes of the Lord. And I saw my life that I'm living now through the eyes of the Lord, but looking back from the millennial age. And he says, and my whole life was meaningless. All my hobbies, all of the different things that I had spent time on, had no relevancy whatsoever. The only thing that counted was that which I had done in direct answer to the call and the purpose for which I had been created. Did I walk in my calling? Did, if God makes a hammer, at some point he expects it to hit a nail. If God makes a saw, at some point he expects it to cut some wood. If God makes an instrument, at some point he expects that there would be sound coming forth from that instrument. Wouldn't it be a tragedy if the thing that he had made never did what he made it to do? Never found its purpose. And there's this thing inside me that says, oh God, more than anything else, I want to walk in my purpose and I want to... I want to be connected to a body of believers that are absolutely 100% committed to discovering their purpose, to entering in, saying, come Holy Spirit, come living God, and take out of me anything that holds me back from you. Take out of me anything that holds you back from me. Come in, King of glory. Open up gates. Open up the gates of my heart. Open up the gates of my personality, my identity, my perspective. Open up my mindsets that the king of glory may come in. And he wants to come in. And it looks different. He's going to come in like this. Because he's already in here. But he's going to come into our natural reality from within us. It's Christ within us, the hope of glory. It's Christ within us, the hope of glory. And we're going, oh God, will you do something else? And he's like, I'm in here. If you'll abide in me and the more you'll spend time in my presence, all of a sudden you'll begin to realize that the, that the change you think bind you are on the inside and they're lies. I've already set you free. I've already empowered you. I've already called you. I've already equipped you. I've already enabled you. I'm protecting you, watching over you. Abide in me and you will produce much fruit. It's not even a question. It's not like, well, may, I don't know if this will really happen. It's guaranteed. The branch abides in the vine and it produces fruit because the life of the vine flows through the branch. God is calling us to abide. But I don't know, can we just, could we talk practically? What would that look like for you? Don't answer, just think in your mind. What will that look like for you for the rest of today? Are you going to do anything different than what you planned? Because if this is really God speaking, then I, I think we should do something. And if it's not, man, you should go find a church where the leaders actually hear the Lord and preach his word. And if, and if I'm not preaching his word, then discern that and say, God, where are you moving me? <laughs> or maybe you're going to go into intercession that as leaders we really would hear his word. I believe we're hearing his word, and I know what he did four weeks ago, and three weeks ago, and two weeks, last week. I know what he's doing, and he's calling us to enter in. What are you going to do on Monday that will be different? What are you going to do on Tuesday? Listen, I can enter in and have a zenith in God, just me and God alone in my secret place, but that's not going to change Canada. It's going to take a company of people. It's going to take a company of people. There's juice in the grape, but the anointing is in the cluster. The anointing is in the cluster. The glory of God will manifest as a people in one heart and one mind push in to seek him and say, God, forgive us. Forgive us for being so distracted. How much time have I wasted on social media when I could have been spending time in intimacy with you in your word, abiding with you? Listen, if we want to change the people around us, we don't need to study darkness. 
<laughs> you can't, the Bible says be wise concerning good and ignorant concerning evil. Everybody running around watching all these videos online about the end of the age and all this stuff. You know what, if you just press in and spend time in his word and invite his presence and say, come Holy Spirit, what else is going on in here? Rather than running around watching all sorts of negativity that's happening, posting all, get all this paranoia going on in the body of Christ. It's not about how much I know what the devil's doing. It's about how much I know Jesus that impacts my ability in order to share that love with other people. Jesus didn't study darkness. He communed with his father. If we will commune with God, listen, we will get far more done if we will commune with God. Connor, where you at? Oh, he's in Sunday school. He had an awesome word he called and shared with me. He was in the grocery store. And he got some bananas. And he got a ripe banana. Sorry, an unripe banana. And he started eating it. He's like, oh, this thing's not ripe. Then he remembered, that's right. They pick them while they're still very green. Because they have to travel a long way to get to the store. And then they kind of try and let them ripen on the shelf or whatever. But he did a little bit of study and he discovered there's nowhere near the amount of nutrients in that which is picked and brought from a long way away is that which ripens on the vine, that which ripens on the plant itself. And he was saying, I really feel the Lord is speaking about that. You know what we do? We run in for a few minutes with Jesus and then we go out and we try and minister. And he's like, no, will you give me the best of your time? Will you give me the best of your time? Will you soak in my presence? Will you push into me, meditate on my word, invite me to come in? And not just a courtesy thing, like fill me up quick because i got to go do a bunch of stuff so I can feel better about myself and that I'm a good Christian and that everybody thinks I'm loving. Love the Lord your God first with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And as you do that, you'll come into a place where you understand his love for you and you begin to love yourself with a healthy, beautiful love. And then we won't be needy like, like we heard from, from John Moeller, remember? What did he say? We weren't created to need love. We were created to be love. But in the garden when we didn't trust him and we sinned and we reached out and, 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 and took what we thought we needed in order to be happy, then love, we were created in the image of God, and the image of God is love. Then love got flipped 180 degrees, and it became self. And because of that, then it's really easy to get offended at anybody, at anything, for anything. Somebody I know just started working in a retail store. This person was just describing to me the, the spirit of entitlement that is in the age. Everybody is coming and they're all mad and everything. Coming to these people who are being paid probably minimum wage, you know, behind the counter. And like, well, I can't believe this. I'm never shopping in this store again. Living in a land of luxury, of abundance. So unhappy. I went on a couple of cruises. It's not my, it's not my thing. I know lots of people enjoy it. I just, I'm so grieved being around all of these middle-aged and older people who are so unhappy <laughs> and, and, you know, baking themselves red like lobsters. And it's just like, man, you shouldn't wear that bathing suit, really. <laughs> Maybe 40 years ago. Never mind that. We don't even do that in the kingdom. But they're so unhappy. They're in the lineup and their food comes and I was with Ken and Char and, and, uh, and their family, and my wife and I were there with our kids, and the waiters kept coming back to our table. More waiters than were supposed to be at our table. And th they will come, and if someone has a birthday, they will bring you a special cake. They brought us cake after cake after cake, not even because it was our birthday, just because they wanted to, 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 to serve us, and they liked hanging out because they said, we've never seen a happier group of people. You know, Pastor Ken, praise God. What are you going to have to eat, Mike? I'm going to try that and that and that and that. <laughs> Just so happy. And if anything's not right, he doesn't care. That's all right. We'll just have some more of something. <laughs> Guys, God doesn't want us to complain. That's not the word in season that brings joy. That's not the word that sustains the weary as well. I can't believe well, that's probably the problem because we're believers. 
Unbelievable. Really? Come on. Thomas believed finally when he saw. You're seeing it and you still declare it unbelievable. You're worse than him. People see something happen. They're like, it's unbelievable. I'm like, you saw it. Thomas at least believed finally when he saw, but you're like, I'm seeing it and I still don't believe it. That's a spirit of unbelief. Cast that thing out of you. Don't say unbelievable. Come on, we're believers. Nothing's unbelievable. All things are possible. All things are possible. Thank you, Lord. Let's turn in our Bibles. Another scripture here. First John 2. Oh, Father God. Oh, guys. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Whether he's coming in the rapture or not, I can't tell you, but I can tell you this. Jesus is coming to our church. Jesus said in Revelation, and behold, I come quickly. And people are like, 2,000 years, that's not very quick. And they miss the point that Jesus has come again and again and again, over and over again. He has brought himself to a people, and he has offered them death and life and said, choose life. And many people have chosen comfort instead of life. But if we're going to press in and if we're going to see all the promises on the wall downstairs, if we're going to see them manifest in us and in our children who desperately need them, our children need us to contend and break through the spiritual membrane that is hindering what God wants to do. Our children need us to do that. And if we're going to see that happen, then we're, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost you some sleep. It's going to cost you some food. God's going to call you to fast. Jesus did not say if you fast. He said when you fast. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have fasted in the last year? Don't raise your hand. But just this is just between you and God. Are you prepared to fast if you haven't fast? Or have you decided... You know, kind of like when people are talking and all of a sudden they say something that someone doesn't want to hear and the person's like, no, 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 no. We do that as Christians. There's certain scriptures like, oh, God loves you with an everlasting love. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. All things work together for the good of those that love God. And he will give back to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Oh, my ears are wide open to hear this. But all of a sudden it's like the Lord disciplines those he loves. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So what that means is that that little thought that you had that said, I should spend some time in the word. And then we blow it off. We're like, no, 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 no. That was God that we just said no to. We just said, no, God. I know I called you Lord, but just kidding. That's why it says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we miss it. Listen, Anna and Simeon, two saints of God in the, in, in the New Testament, have been waiting to see Jesus, have been abiding, have been praying, have been seeking him in his temple, have been contending for the manifestation of the promise. And all of a sudden, one day, the Lord speaks to them and says, go, go to the temple. You're going to see it today the Messiah? Today, you're going to see it. Okay. So Simeon goes there. He's like, wow, what's it going to look like? What's it going to look like when it comes? Oh, it's going to be, he's going to be glowing. He's going to float in with angel's wings. It's, I don't know. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be amazing. And all of a sudden, here comes a run-of-the-mill, stereotypical-looking Jewish couple with a new baby, eight days old comes into the temple like thousands have come in before. And the Lord says, Simeon, that's him. That's him? Yes. Kind of looks the same as all the other babies. And, and the mom and, and the dad, that, that's them? That, this is it? Yes. The still small boys. You will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Simeon, 
Anna, this is the Messiah. Okay. May I pray for this child? By faith, thank you, Lord. I just choose to believe. How many of you are hearing still small voices, little thoughts in your mind in this season? And the enemy's going, that's nothing. Come on, it's got to come with fanfare. It's got to come with a da -da 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 and a big boom and some confetti. That's not how God comes. He comes in a simple word on, on a Sunday that you think, I'm going to church. It's December 4th, 2016. And we're always, we're always putting off the manifestation of the glory of God into some other age at some other time. And we convince ourselves, I'll be ready for it then when it shows up. But when it shows up, it will not show up like we expect it to show up. But God will speak and he will confirm. And he will say, I am doing a new thing. Behold, now it springs forth. Will you not perceive it? Will you not perceive it? And what is the new thing that he's doing? He's inviting us in. He's inviting us in to abide. I think it's 18 years ago in this church. A woman came by the name of Carol Cartwright. Amazing woman of God. Older woman, not flashy. She's from the south, had a bit of a southern drawl. And she got up and she preached. And at the end of her preaching, she started over here and she went one by one, every single person. And she prophesied over every single person in the place. It took hours. And she was as accurate with the last person as she was with the first. And I was doing sound, kind of like this morning. And I was up there and I thought, I'm going to wait for the last. Because, you know, uh, God saves the best for last. And I want the best. I'll just look humble and tell everybody else, no, you go ahead. Come on, we know, we know this brain, you know what I mean? This, all sorts of like self in there. And someone came and said, you need to go down. She's, your wife is sitting over there. Go down. She's, she's going to be prophesying over your wife. You should be beside your wife. I was like, oh, fine. So I went down there, and I was like, okay, come on, give it to me. Give me the big word. Come on. You're going you're gonna to walk on water. Man, you're going to have gold teeth, gold, gold hair, gold feet, gold nails, gold watches, Rolexes, everything showing up in your meeting. Come on. Come on. Give you're going to go preach to the nations. Millions are going to get saved. Come on. I'm just ready, God. Give me a word. Give me... And she comes up, she goes, can you do that? I'm like, yeah. She goes, okay, just checking. Michael, Lord is calling you to the prayer closet. <laughs> and you two don't pray together much, do you? That's why you guys have disagreements and fights. But if you'll start praying together more, the Lord will give you one mind and one spirit. Are you kidding me? Rebuke in front of everybody. <laughs> and the Lord knows that, that life is busy with a young man, with a young family, but he's calling you to get up in the morning, come and seek him, both at the church and at home. I despised that word. Oh, not outwardly. That's pretty dumb to do that, you know. This is a prophet. But inwardly, I was like, what? The prayer closet? What about the nations? What about, like, what about miracles, signs, and wonders, and all sorts of stuff like that? The prayer closet? I mean, I made an effort, a half-hearted effort. But I didn't follow through. In the last 18 years, God has spoken to me over and over again. And one of the most profound pictures that he gave me was when we were living on Kingsley Terrace just up here. Probably be a mess sharing it. The people who had had the house before us had eight or nine cats. We have a cat. Some of you have seen it. It's a pretty weird looking cat. I'm not really a cat person so much. <laughs> kind of like dogs. But they left and they took all their cats. 
And they said to us, by the way, there's, there's one black cat that comes around. It's kind of in rough shape, sort of a street cat. Um, and we've been feeding it. It's pretty wild, you know, and it's not super healthy either. So I know you got little babies, so whatever you guys feel to do. But just so you know, if you see it around, it's because we were feeding it. Well, we saw the cat all right. Demon cat. <laughs> this thing had no tail, lost its tail, had infection oozing from behind its ears, was built like a pit bull, was solid black, and was deaf. Couldn't hear anything. And it would come slinking around our property. And we saw this other cat that saw that cat thing. The, the, the black cat never saw the other one, but the other one saw this one, and as soon as it saw it, it went up in the air like this fast and took off running. <laughs> and my wife looked at that cat, and she went, that, that thing's dangerous, man. And I got little babies. Our kids were real small at the time. She's like, Livy was just a baby. She said, took the broom, and she said, no, get, get away from here. Get away from here. And it survived the first winter. I think it was in the second, maybe the second winter or something like that. My wife's heart started breaking for this thing. She thought, how's it even living? So she started putting out a little bit of food for it. A little bit of food. And the cat would come and it would eat the food. And pretty soon she's feeding it eggs and everything. I'm like, thing eats better than we do. <laughs> she's trying to get it to a place and its coat started getting shinier. And she's, she's, but it was so skittish. <laughs> Making those weird noises and stuff. And so she was so gentle. And I remember being inside one time, and all of a sudden she comes in the door, and she's kind of holding her hands out like this. And I'm like, what are you doing? She says, it let me touch it. I was petting it. And it was like pushing against me so hard it wanted love so bad. It was pushing against me. I'm like, so what's with your hands? She's like, they smell really bad. And I'm like, oh, oh, go wash your hands. And then I, I started thinking, because, you know, you know, I'm, I'm getting closer to it, and it's coming. I'm like, this thing's still really wild and, and messy. I'm, I'm thinking, where's this going to go from here? My wife's like, well, I'm not sure. I'm like, I mean, the more we feed it and everything, what's our ultimate goal? Well, would be to make it part of the family. Right? Isn't, isn't that, I mean, if you're going to start showing love to something and get it healthy and whole, don't you want it to, to no longer be vicious and, and tormented and lonely? You want it to come in and find a home. And I'm like, but, but does this cat and its little cat mind, does it understand the process that's going to be involved for that to happen? It's going to come in and at some point we're going to be like, okay, kitty, you're going to go see the vet and he's going to stick you with a needle and that's going to be good for you. And then we're going to wash you. And you know what cats think of water. And there's going to be a whole training thing, and you know, there's going to be boundaries, and sometimes we won't let you out. And we're going to keep you inside. and we're, like, we, have to, we have to bring a wholeness to not just your body, but your soul, your mind. And in the midst of my wife showing love to this thing, God moved us, and we sold our house, and we moved to another area. And... and uh, we never saw the cat again, but the Lord began to speak to me. And he said, you know, my children are just like the cat. It's beat up, demonized, missing parts, broken, hurting, other cats running away. And he says, and I want to bring you into my home. And that cat in its mind, all it can think of is food. I just want food. Give me food. Fine. I got my food. Good. I'll go away and be alone because I know when I'm alone, nobody steals my food. And the Lord said, my children come into my presence and they want prophetic words about what they're going to do in the nations. And I'm just like, hey, why don't you come and be part of my family? There's a process, and you might not like some of that process. There's some breaking involved. There's some sacrifice involved, but you got to trust me. And we're like, no, just give me a word about what I'm going to do to the nations and what I'm going to go, because we're so insecure on the inside that we turn up our nose at the invitation to intimacy. And the Lord says, okay, all right, okay, here's some food. Man, if you would trust me, you have a bowl that's overflowing all the time. 
But I understand this is where you're at right now. So here's a prophetic word that you're going to go and you're going to prophesy and you're going to do a whole bunch of things in the nations. And, oh, and, here's, and th- there's this gift that you have and, da, 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 and this is going to happen. And, but remember, God doesn't need us, guys. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our gifts. He could do it like that if he wanted. And he is in different places around the world. He's saving whole villages. He could do the Paul, of, Paul on the road to Damascus thing to anybody at any time. We're not here because he needs us. We're here because this is the best place that we can become transformed into his image if we will behold him. 1 Corinthians 3.18, we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image even as from glory to glory. And that's wonderful, the worship that we have here on a Sunday morning. But if that's all you're getting, then you're just getting dessert. You're not getting the main course. The main course is you alone with God. You alone with God. Get alone with God and pray. Get alone with God and seek him. Get alone and have it out with him and say, God, what's going on? Am I I where you want me to be? Am I doing what you want me to be doing? And if not, how do I get there? And what does that look like? Is there anything in my life that I've made an idol out of? Have I still got a spirit of independence that goes, well, I'll give this and I'll give this, but don't ask me to give that. Am I willing to receive your correction, your rebuke, your instruction? And am I willing for that to come through other people who are your servants, who are part of the body? God is inviting us in to intimacy, and there's nothing higher that he can give us. There's no greater treasure. There's no greater position. Listen, if we will come in, the Lord was speaking to me. I've been, I've been doing some prayer with uh, Braden and, and uh, we've just been pushing in and, and seeking the Lord and the Lord is speaking to me and saying you know you've lost so many even in the awakening here that's because you got so busy but if you'll push in and put me first and seek me and get alone with me and then turn around at my direction and pray for them for 10 minutes I'll accomplish more in 10 minutes than what you could have done in 10 days of counseling and meeting and pleading and please leave your addiction and please 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 because I can set I, I'm a whole lot more efficient than you are but you put me first. You put me first. You learn how to abide. First John 2, I told you to turn there, verse 24. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. What did we hear from the beginning? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We complicate it. It's a simple gospel. God wants relationship with his children again. It's not about doing a whole bunch of stuff. He will get us doing stuff. And when revival comes, we will be active in his kingdom. And I said active, not busy. We will be active at the leading of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what it's about. It's about relationship. It's about intimacy. And this is the promise, verse 25, that he has promised us. Eternal life. Eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him. That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. The first command is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Only then will you be empowered to love your neighbor as you love yourself because it's in loving God that way that you're going to come into a place where you actually love you, where you can look at you in the mirror and go, man, you are amazing. Whoa, I I like you. I'm glad I'm living inside you. And I'm glad Jesus is living inside me. Christ in us, the hope of glory. As we get alone, each of us, as we press into the secret place and learn to abide in him, we will get a revelation of the kingdom of God within us. Fear of man will fall away. Boldness, Holy Spirit-inspired creativity, wisdom, ideas, understanding on how to reach people. And our prayers will be heard on high because we won't be throwing him the leftovers of our day. 
but we will giving, be giving him the best part of us. You know, I challenge you, if you don't have a secret place, start with 15 minutes. Just take 15 minutes and get alone with God in the midst of your busyness, which probably for most of you is going to mean setting your alarm clock 15 minutes earlier. Get up. Talk to him. doesn't matter how you feel. doesn't matter. You're like, I need coffee. No, you need Jesus. And just begin to worship him and say, God, I, I, I'm here on this planet because of you. I'm, I, I woke up because of you. I'm alive because of you. You said in your word in you, I live and move and have my being. I'm coming to see you real soon. I'm going to stand before you. And I don't want to be ashamed at that moment and suddenly realize, oh, what a fool I've been. None of us can get away from that appointment. It's coming for every single one of us. I, I can't stand beside you. I won't be there going, yeah, I'm his pastor, okay? So just take it easy on him. I can't stand beside my wife or my children. It's just going to be me alone with God, you alone with God. And he's inviting us into intimacy now. And those who will hear that now will be like the wise virgins who receive oil in their lamps. That they might not be ashamed at his coming. That they might be prepared even when there's divine delay. All of them fell asleep, but the wise virgins still had extra oil. And that oil is the oil of intimacy, it's spending time with him. All of you housewives and mothers, find time, whether it's when you're doing dishes or even when you're having a shower, rather than just thinking about your day and all the busyness, just praise him, worship him. God's calling all of us. This is not just leadership or pastors or intercessors that he is inviting into a closer relationship with him. It's every single one of us, every single one of us. He wants to know us. He said, well, he knows me already. That's not what scripture says. Jesus says to a whole bunch of people, I never knew you. And those people were busy doing lots of stuff, casting out devils, prophecy, miracles. And Jesus says, I never knew you. The highest call of God is intimacy. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we don't want to be people who Hear the word, but don't do it. You said that those people are like ones who build their house on sand. They have no foundation. Lord, deliver us from the lie that mental assent means that we possess the truth. Just mentally agreeing with a word when it's being preached doesn't mean that we're living it out in our lives. Father, you're inviting your church to know you like never before. You're saying we're going to need that for the season that we're coming into, for there is persecution that is coming. And Lord, you're saying, if you'll draw near to me, I'll hide you in my secret place. And no matter what happens to your body, you will be fine. For your life is hidden with Christ in God. Lord, we ask that you would challenge us, that you would remind us of this word throughout the week. Lord, that we would each set time aside to read your word, to worship you, to thank you for all the gifts and the things that you've given us to pray with our family over our children, Lord God. Lord, to invite your inspection anywhere and everywhere that needs correction or adjustment, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We want to love you more. We want to know you more. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and move upon us, we ask, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. amen.